To celebrate the International Day for Universal Access to Information, join UNESCO in affirming and reiterating the urgency to respect and maintain the right to information, especially amid the COVID-19 outbreak. In times of emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to protect the right to access information so that communities can protect themselves and their families. Journalists debunk the falsehoods and report the facts about the disease. Scientists and policymakers provide us with directives and guidance on how to cope with the pandemic. Citizens can know the measures to prevent and mitigate the risks. That's why we need public information without delay, with strong and effective institutions to keep citizens informed. Access to information is not a burden, but a right that needs to be supported by law. And any restrictions to this right should conform to the law, be proportionate and limited to protect the citizens. Join our high-level webinar on 28 September and all the online events across the world that UNESCO and partners are organizing to celebrate our right to access information. Go to our website for more information. Access to information, saving lives, building trust, bringing hope. So uh, greetings, everybody. I am Guy Berger, and I work for UNESCO. I'm not a young person, as you can see, but I've been told that young people want certain things and are striving for certain things. Education, electricity, clean water, clean air, jobs, good health for families, friends, meaningful relationships, human rights, justice, equality, peace. And all of this depends on young people having access to information. That access lets everyone, including young people, know where our representatives, the duty bearers in our society, the people of my generation, access to information lets you know what we are doing or not doing to deliver the future that you want and that you deserve. This access to information means that you should have affordable access to information. It should be accessible in terms of language. It should be accessible to disabled people of all ages. It should be inclusive. What's important in the theme today is that this access is also about competencies. It's about what you young people do with that information. It's about your skills, how you understand and use that information. You know, the, the World Health Organization at this point in time has come up with the concept of infodemic, by which they mean you get a, a mix of information and disinformation and misinformation. And it's such a confusing overload that you don't know what is what. Now, the significance of this for young people especially is that how can you really know who you are and develop your own identity if you're in this flood of content and you don't know what you can trust? You could say it's a bit like being in a real flood. The danger is you can drown. So you need to learn how to swim. You need to recognize, unfortunately, when there is sewage in that water. You need to know how to demand that there should be clean water and that there should not be unregulated flooding taking place. You need to also know how to respond to the subtleties about which way the water is flowing, because indeed in social media, there's so much data that is being used to present you with certain information just to move you a little bit 
in order to get you to believe certain things, buy certain things, or have certain uh, beliefs about what is beautiful, uh, about what is trendy, about what is acceptable in terms of the way you can relate to people. So it's also important in this age of the infodemic to know when it's time to get out of the water because this water, it's, it's addictive. You young people, I think you know how easy it is to get addicted to being in a situation where you get these dopamine hits. Dopamine is a particular hormone and it, you get it when you're getting these pings and you're getting recognition in social media. Now, all of this suggests to us that when you have access to information, you also need to have access to information in your terms, not the terms of those who are presenting you this information. You need to know from a knowledgeable and a skilled position, and you need to know together. And that means media and information literacy. Having youth that is media and information literate to deal with this access to information is so important for yourselves and for the whole of the society. So today we're celebrating the International Day for Universal Access to Information, focusing upon young people. And it's also the kickstart kick of what UNESCO calls the Global MIL, Media and Information Literacy, Global MIL Week Youth Forum Agenda that will continue from now up until the end of October. Please look at our website. I'm sure my colleagues will post links in the chat. And you can see what's more, what, is, what is going to happen, especially in terms of regional webinars on this question of Global MIL Youth Week. A key part of the webinar today is to start a draft plan of action for youth engagement in the policies and the strategies that will continue up till the end of October. These policies and strategies are how you as young people can impact on access to information, including access, access to information laws. You have a right to access to information. People have a duty to meet your rights. This is going to be about how you can develop an action plan to assert your right. And that includes action about how you and your colleagues and others who are not even involved in this can develop their media and information literacy about what it means to have access to information. So we want at UNESCO to thank all the stakeholders, including the MIL Youth Ambassador of the uh, GAPMIL, which is the UNESCO MIL Alliance, who've contributed to the initial consultations that we launched two weeks ago. After today, we'll go through several iterations of this uh, draft action plan. All participants in this webinar will get a link to the action plan. And we will continue this in regional webinars as the weeks continue up till the high point of the end of October. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being part of this pioneering work for youth to be involved in bringing together MIL and ATI, media and, info, media and information literacy, access to information, and for young people to impact on access to information policy and implementation around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Alexandre Manel. I'm an independent journalist here from Brazil, and I'll be moderating uh, this fantastic webinar. I'm really looking forward to it because we have incredible speakers lined up ahead. Uh, but I just want to reiterate what Guy said. I think it's super important that we think of access to information in our own terms, especially when we talk about youth. Uh, it, it's not just being there in, in, a, in a policy or a strategy. Uh, if we look at the at ATI laws that were implemented in the last 10 years, for example, uh, over the globe, they have risen from 40 to 126 laws. Uh, but I know that in many countries, this doesn't mean that people have access to information easily, especially because it's super difficult to get in there, to have all the skill and knowledge and, and the critical thinking to actually go through the legal process to access that information. So to serve the rights of the citizens, uh, there's a clear link here in the set of competences that 
encompasses media and information literacy, which is the ability to be able to think critically, access, reflect upon information, uh, and then act in a, in a concerned way in society. So for that, we have incredible speakers lined up today. Uh, so at the end, this is supposed to be a conversation. So we're going to be inviting everyone, all the participants here on the Zoom, uh, to also give their inputs on the draft plan of action that Guy said. So we want to engage youth in policies and strategies related to access to information and media information literacy. Uh, so the link is going to be in the chat. We're seeking your contribution. This is supposed to be a, a debate, a conversation that we built together. So please give us our feedback. But I'm going to get out of the way now. Let's get started with this incredible speaker, which is Christina Monti. She's the founder and creative producer of Talk Up Radio, speaking on behalf of UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. Now, Christina, I'm really looking forward to your contribution because you work at the grassroots. You work at capacity building, promoting media information literacy for youth and by youth. So tell us a little bit of your experience and how can we use uh, this critical engagement into access to information policies? The floor is yours. Thanks, Alexandre. <laughs> um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic today. Thank you to the Youth Envoy for nominating me to share my own experience. Um, and thank you to everyone here, especially the young people. Uh, as a media and information literacy competency, access to information plays a powerful role in youth civic engagement, an effect which can be bolstered and made self-sustaining with consistent strategic investment and systems change. Now, given the significant challenges we are facing as a globe and will face in the years to come, Civic engagement, which is having more minds and energies in problem solving, change making and monitoring has never been more important. Therefore, now is the time to really put the priorities we've already signed on to in the SDGs and other key policies to the service of people and the planet. Um, so just to share a bit of my own experience, I've worked in civic media, specifically youth media for the last seven years, since I was 19 years old, when I managed to convince the executive producer of an amazing youth media platform in Jamaica called Talk of Youth to hire me as a writer for a school tour, as fresh out of high school, but you know, I managed to convince her anyway. And for about three months, we visited different high schools around the around the, um, Jamaica, and I got to spend my time just having my worldview, my understanding of the scope of issues that young people go through just completely blown apart and listening to students speak up about the very serious issues they were dealing with from crime and violence to mental health and then I was able to write articles that helped to further amplify their voices to decision makers. Now that experience, the work I did, the information, people, the points of view I was exposed to, the way I was mentored as the youngest member of the team, made it clear to me that that's something that I wanted to do going forward, to use my skills to create and support anyone making a difference in other people's lives. And since then, I've you know, produced radio and television, I've directed videos, written screenplays, articles, songs, I've voice acted like so many things just to support youth voice and turning that into youth action. Now, my own experiences in creating youth media sparked my interest in, in more broader civic engagement. I started paying closer attention to the governance of my country um, and it prepared me to ask questions about the work politicians do on my behalf as a citizen. And in creating youth media with youth teams, I spent maybe the first four years of my career watching hundreds of Jamaican young people experience the exact same thing. Now, if the goal of access to information is active citizenship, where all people are empowered to be able to make use of access to information powers to improve their lives, well, that begins in moments like I've just described, in advocacy organizations, in fan clubs and book clubs, in pop culture podcasts, in short films, wherever young people gather and critically engage with media as creators or consumers, this effect from media and information literacy becomes possible. So 
I just I wanted to make sure that you know that wasn't just my experience or a Jamaican phenomenon. So when I had the opportunity to study um, at the graduate level, I decided to look at this same phenomenon in the UK. And I found that it's largely the same. It doesn't matter whether you're a young black kid in South London running a YouTube channel celebrating diversity, or you're 25 and you're running one of the world's largest online magazines for young women, non-binary and trans people of color. When young people are supported in developing and leveraging media and information literacy, it has a remarkable impact on them. Firstly, they gain a sense of civic imagination, which is an ability to notice and process systems, injustice, oppression, and to discern between pro-social and anti-social causes, organizations, and opinions, and very importantly, to be able to imagine better alternatives that serve them and the planet. Two, they gain a sense of civic agency, the confidence, network, skills, support to deliberately design and implement solutions and to practice their politics. Three, they gain a sense of civic engagement. They begin to feel connected to other people and to form communities and networks. And I mean, I don't have enough time to tell you all the benefits that I've actually noticed through all of my years of work and research, but it's, it's important to state, though, that not nearly enough young people, in fact, very few young people globally have opportunities to develop this sense of civic agency, imagination, engagement, and most importantly, civic access required to sustain greater youth knowledge and critical engagement in ATI policies. So I have three recommendations. Firstly, we have to increase investment in and partnerships with youth led media organizations and youth organizations to encourage growth in this sector. A youth led is in particular is very important here because what we found both my own research and other notable media scholars is that once these organizations come into contact with institutional influences, it drives down creativity and negatively impacts their effectiveness. So you really have to set the standard by continuing to collaborate with them, leave them alone, let them run themselves, but push them, support them, build them up and, you know, encourage governments to do the same instead of what we usually see, which is they only ever elevate the voices of young people in formal mechanisms like a national student council or a youth parliamentary system where there's an incentive to play by the rules. You don't want that, you want actual meaningful engagement. Furthermore, the UN should lead the way in making this meaningful engagement possible. Taking a page from the UN youth strategy and their first priority is engagement, participation and advocacy. Amplify youth voices for the promotion of a peaceful, just, and sustainable world. Secondly, neither young people nor media and information literacy can do this alone. So all other sectors of society must come together to encourage access to information reform, to ensure the legislation works for us and serves our needs rather than the other way around. Governments should en endeavor to be more accessible to, to citizens, to build relationships with them, to support them in improving their capacity to understand and engage with policy. It's not enough to just say the young people won't understand and then just leave it there. You have to translate policies into local languages, implement regular virtual town halls where citizens get access information broken down. You know, recently on a media institute of the Caribbean um, IDUIA panel this week, senior journalists were calling for the end of the culture of secrecy and encouraging preemptive release of information. So you don't have to go and go through this whole heap of legislation to find things that you as a citizen should inherently have right to. It's about you and your life and the governance of your country. Why would your government hide that from you? So, you know, preemptive release of information, building relationships, encouraging engaged citizenship instead of this sometimes adversarial in relationship that we tend to have where journalists and active citizens are painted as the enemy. We're not the enemy. We all have the same goal of, you know, encouraging this process, um, you know, so that's number two. And the final one is, um, you know, as a young journalist and an activist, I also have to caution that not only can it be difficult to be an engaged active citizen, it can also be dangerous. Therefore, we have to take guidance from SDG 16, 
promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And target 10, ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. You know, we, we have to take that seriously. We have to make sure that the space is there for people to access it. You know, it has to be an end to corruption, transparency institutions. There's no way to talk about this without talking about the framework that enables people to continue to be left out. So, you know, and particularly regarding youth on this one, the youth strategy's fourth priority speaks to protecting and promoting the rights of young people and supporting their civic and political engagement. Because it's not just enough for us to invest in building up young people and building up access to information. We have to make it safe. And we have to protect young people in playing their part in advancing the welfare of their countries and the planet. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, you know, we have COVID-19 and we know that, you know, there's so many global challenges that we're going through. And maybe, you know, media and information literacy probably would not have solved COVID-19, but it would definitely have helped us to deal with some of the misinformation and all of that that we're dealing with now, you know, anti-mask sentiment, people not being able to check their governments when they're not doing what they need to do. So this is critical. You need to invest in young people from the ground up because in situations like this, you get to see why it's so critical, why it's so important. You know, over a million people have died worldwide. We have to do everything that we can to prevent that kind of thing and ensuring there's information and that people can access it safely, you know, and are comp and competently is very, very important. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad I was able to share. Chris, that was a fantastic talk, woman. I'm already excited here. I mean, in 10 minutes, you already got my blood going because I think that's what youth and access to information and media literacy is all about. It's about trying to bring change, you know, thinking critically and acting in society. So you just got me on a better mood already, Chris. That was fantastic. Uh, and now let's, let's keep the ball rolling. Uh, the next person on the list is Daniel Noise. Uh, a personal friend of mine and the global coordinator of UNESCO MIL Alliance Youth Committee, uh, also a part of the Ad African Youth Movement. Now, Daniel, I think it's super important that we build up on what Chris just said, which is the, the importance of building communities, building trust and meaningful engagements. But it, it can be quite a challenge to try to bring all this access to information policies or, or standards that we uphold in a global level to the regional context. We also need to establish a sort of cooperation, intergenerational cooperation. So how do we do that exactly? The floor is yours, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, are you there? Seems that we might have a connection issues. Hence, why access to information is so important. Connectivity is not enough. But no, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. I'm here, Marco. I, I had to change my location because it was becoming noisy, so I had to change my location. But I'm here. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can, Daniel. Perfect. So I really love to build on what um, Christina said because, like you mentioned, she really kind of pumped up um, emotions. She pumped up my emotions, talking about how we as young people cannot do it alone and how it's very, very important to have young people um, play key roles in everything that we do. So um, two days ago, I was speaking in a similar role, and I mentioned that we as young people, um, we have the passion, we have the drive, but we really need to work with the older generation, you know, to let them understand that we are not actually being stubborn or being very hesitant, but we just want to work with them. We want to share uh, more of our creativity and get to work with them to do the things that we want to do or to implement the policies that, um, that we want to implement. And so Christina mentioned that, oh, she had to um, 
push harder as a young person to prove ourselves so that they can now um, get to give us the opportunities that she wants. And that shouldn't be so. Um, our skills and the experience should be able to stand out for us, to be able to speak um, for us in everything that we do. And that's where my conversation come about, building intergenerational dialogue and be able to implement um, these policies. Because as young people, we don't want to just be at the table or sit at the table for ceremonial purposes. We want to have this feeling of co-ownership. We want to have this feeling of being part of the process from start to finish um, and to execution. And Mr. Guy, when he was talking, mentioned about um, how we need to work together and what has been happening in the, in the, in the regional uh, perspectives. For me, I believe that um, as young people, um, it's true for me, and I, I'm sure it's true for a lot of us that are here. Um, Christina mentioned that there should be this preemptive release of information. And I, I begin to wonder why this is not uh, like the norm, because as, 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 young, as a young person, the more you try to hold information from us, the more inquisitive we become, the more we want to see what's on the other side of this thing that you're trying to hide from us. So I, I think that um, being very preemptive and being very open and giving this free flow of access to information um, is very, very key. And one thing I mentioned two days ago, which I actually want to reiterate here also is that Information is not just key. Information is also life. Look at um, what's happening around the world today, COVID-19. Um, all of us would accept that it was due to the fact that there was no um, fast release of information or there was no proper information sharing that it's evolved into a pandemic, that the WHO um, director had to even name it an infodemic also alongside a pandemic. And then we also see that information also, when the world began to release information and began to share information, we began to see how life-saving drug, um, life-saving processes were being developed. Doctors began to understand the genome sequence. Doctors began to know what to do and then poly um, politicians began to know what kind of policies to put in place to slow down the spread. So with that, we're able to save as many lives as possible, even though um, more people were still dying. So information is not just key. It's also so life is to determine what we do next and how we do um and how we do what we do next so and in doing this is the older generation have this um a very wide number of experiences and we as young people we have the drive we have the commitment we also have um the expertise that we're bringing into the table and we're not just um being ceremonial and i really love um the initiative that the likes of the u.n secretary envoy is taking and also the likes of the african union envoy to have people like christina um working with them bringing in policy um issues from the ground where they work in, um, in the very um, in the various countries so we have to see more of this we don't just want to have oh one section just for um youth youth, youth. no we have to be um it, it has to be like a normal process whereby young people are also part of the process and also on the table and one of the things i'm very very happy for which is kind of rare is that i i, I live in nigeria and i'm from the global south and um UNESCO, the UNESCO office here in Abuja is really taking um, a very, very good action by supporting young people and building, bridging, um, building this kind of intergenerational um, dialogue um, between young people and more experienced journalists or media people or policymakers. And this we've been trying to do, like supporting from day one, also um, the UNESCO HQ. And Bushra um, is also working with the UNESCO, um, the Canada Commission for UNESCO in Canada, and she, they've been very, very supportive of her. We want more actions like this. We want more supportive initiatives like this. And um, for me, that um, those are my key contributions. And some of the core principles that should form these things are that sense of ownership. And then it should not just be emotionally driven. It has to be people driven, and it has to be um, data driven also, because we want to be sure we have the facts, and then we want to also be sure that we are doing this is for human and by and by humans and the young people have to be um, at the center table um i've, I've worked with the africa youth movement for for about four or five years now and we try to see how young people can actually be the voice um, in the local community and not just um a one size fit all solution but how young people can develop the solutions that are very imminent to their local community and how um they have this ownership of them being part of the solutions to the issues that we have. So um, coming down to access to information and MIO, it's, it begins to build this consciousness. And then this consciousness begins to build this kind of um, form of independence and then build this Okay, uh, it seems like we lost Daniel, everyone, uh, which is quite common. To be honest, I was giving a class this week talking exactly about access to information and I lost my connection myself. Uh, 
Anyway, it happens. It's just to reiterate how important this is. And he's back, apparently. Are you there, Daniel? Yes, I can see you now. Please, we lost you for, for a second. Oh, wow. Well, and I was talking because my, my feet here were great. Um, where did you look? And we lost you again. Never mind, everyone. We'll just take a, a, a the, slight road off the path here. I can pick up from there. We Can you hear me now? About one minute ago, Daniel. Okay, so um, I was trying to run up at the time when you probably lost me. Um, my, my apologies for that. So what I was saying is that we have to begin to see this um, um, feel, have this feeling of co-ownership, um, being part of the process, um, and not just being on the table. And I mentioned the amazing work that um, the um, Canada Commission for UNESCO is doing um, um, with the work that they do with Bushra and also the support that we've been getting here on the continent, the UNESCO office in, um, the UNESCO office in Abuja. And um, it, it brings this um, issue of building trust between young people and the older generations, and also trust in the process that um, as you're pushing for access to information, that it's not just to make policies that are going to be very, um, that is going to infringe on our freedom or on our right, but also because we are part of the process, we understand its entirety and that we understand that it is for not just our benefit, but for the benefit of everyone as part of um as part of society and that we as young people we have whatever expertise whatever knowledge um that that needs to be brought on the table and we should not just be there for ceremonial purposes but we should be there because we have the experience we have the knowledge we have the skill um to make things work and to make things happen so um these are my contributions i'll probably contribute more later when you're coming thank you Thank you so much, Daniel. I think I, I just got myself a quote now when I'm going to talk about uh, access to information to people that information is not only key, information is life. Uh, and you said that very beautifully. I think we, we see that more and more uh, in the world that we live today. And leading up to this, to this webinar, we were all contributing to the draft plan of action, of what we want out of this discussion. And I remember that, as Daniel said, uh, it's not only the job of youth to engage with the key actors on the field establishing policies, but it's also that the youth themselves need, need to transform and become these actors uh, that lead to change. So I think that all comes down to, you know, establishing communities, as we said, building trust and building education uh, and empowering people through education, which, which is exactly what we're going to be speaking now uh, with our next speaker, Lusanda Maguape. I hope I pronounced your last name right, Lusanda. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Dream Factory Foundation and also a part of the African Union, European Union Youth Cooperation Hub. How are you, Lusanda? I'm doing very well, thank you. So encouraged by your smile, thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining. I'm joining you from the beautiful country of Botswana. Um, you know, whenever I'm part of these high level macro policy kind of conversations, my, my back end mind is always thinking, how does it really translate to the low income rural based youth who often is left behind in these kinds of conversations and even in the implementation thereof? Um, because it's, it's all fair and well, because aligning with SDGs, I mean, the common virtue of is that, that no one should be left behind. And I say this because, you know, access to information 15 years ago, a library, a textbook was the center in which one could easily flip a page, open a door, produce a card, where you'd be able to access this world of information. Now, including pre um, post COVID in COVID, access to information is being uh, um, held in the homes of the online digital space. I mean, now I'm gonna give you a very personal uh, a, a experience that I had recently, I was writing an online exam. And these are the kind of exams where you have moderators who look 
who are with you during exam. So I'm, I'm, I'm also like actively involved in a farm. So I had to go to the farm, engage, and then at the same time, stop everything that I'm doing and be able to write this exam. So I bought my data, was, you know, using my phone to access it on the laptop. I got into my car, the invigilator tells me, no, you can't be on the car. I'm in a farm. The only place I could go to was the equipment shelter. So I tell them, okay, I'm inside the equipment. I'm going to sacrifice. So they asked me, do a 360 rotation of where you are because the rule of the exam is that no one must be in the room. So I showed them, I said, the only light that I have right now is from opening the door of the shelter. All right, write my exam, 60 questions. I'm now in question 55. And the, a worker is now walking past to alert me or something. All I did was just to say, ah, does the chat box not go up? Now I'm told there's somebody in the room. I'm like, there's no one in the room. I explained to you guys, I'm inside a farm and the only other shelter I could go to was inside the equipment shelter. Disqualified. You know, I was so touched by that moment because number one, the company is an American company. Also, the exam of the organization was from an American, and I, it dawned on me in that, in that moment that here's an educated woman within a physical location in Africa explaining my circumstance, and yet my contextual condition wasn't taken into consideration. They were just you know, happy to say, if you're in a room, and I'm explaining, there's no one in the room. So for me, I realized that it's not good enough to say, here, yeah, youth, you have all this information, go for it, the world is your oyster. No, you have to be contextual. You have to understand what youth you are dealing with, where is that youth placed, and how are they able to receive that information? Number two, you can't talk about access to information without tackling data costs, especially, particularly in low income and rural communities. I mean, with COVID in our organization, we do trainings in schools, we do trainings for unemployed youth. You know, we had to think to ourselves, guys, is it realistic to be tutoring kids on Zoom? Will they be able to afford Zoom? Okay, let's try WhatsApp the cheapest. Will they be able to afford? No. Then we realized we had to, of ourselves, give the data to the young people to be able to access the tutoring, right? So we've realized that access to information in a COVID context, or let's say in a digital context, actually costs more than being able to physically hold classes where everyone can walk, maybe at least within walking distance, you can walk to that classroom. Now it's about accessing a phone, accessing a laptop. So we can't talk about access to information without tackling the data issue. And so at a policy level, these are things that have to be married within each other, right? Like we can't have these discussions without the others going alongside them. Otherwise, it will never work at grassroots level. So number one, being contextual. Number two, the data costs. Number three, what I've realized is that often when we do the trainings, be it South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, we find ourselves having to take, we bring a curricula, we bring the information. Then we find ourselves having to take a step back, teaching the young people how to click a mouse. What is Google search? So in other words, access to information, media literacy has to take a step back and ask yourself the youth that you are dealing with, do they, first of all, know how to access that information? So data inclusion has got to be at the center of, 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 of access for young people. So in other words, things like, like um, Chris was mentioning, for example, it's important to teach young people how to access information online. For example, in South Africa, there were these massive cases of young people being recruited for, for um, for, for either terrorist activities or sexual trafficking, because young people didn't know you don't click this. If you click this, it will lead you on a rabbit trail that will end up having to um, access in your personal information. How do you secure yourself you know, online? So all these things, cyber safety, email etiquette, data processing. And so I think it's not, um, it's, not a, it's, it's a long haul. Um, I think it's easy to have this conversation from a developed perspective, even this Zoom, right? Like, do we take the, the initiative to ask the panelists, guys, do you have internet 
you know, to connect where you at, are you going to, so it's those, we have to now take a step back and be humble within our context. If you're finding ourselves in a more elaborate, uh, developed context, we have to think to ourselves, not everyone is able to access what we're able to access. And then number two, we have to take the long haul. We have to take the patient route. It's not like, you know, click the Zoom link. Some people, for example, I'm also leading a youth leader and I was sending a, a link to my uh, to my youth leader saying, okay, guys, let's meet online. Jiggy, jiggy, come the meeting. People are like, I can't access it. Then I have to think, okay, you have to download Zoom. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's those basic, simple conversations that if you really want to reach the majority, I'm talking about the majority of young people, low income, rural, it's a patient game. Number two, it's important to, to, to teach young people, once you access that information, what do you do? How do you take agency with that information? The critical skills we all spoke about, the problem solving, the collaboration, effective communication. How do you access the information and effectively communicate it in the way that best serves you? So for me right now, I'm the voice of the low income, the voice of the rural youth, because this is what I face on a day-to-day -day basis. And I realize on my pain points, whenever we speak of these, um, in these kinds of discussions and then translate it to really what it means at grassroots le roots level. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh my God, Lusanda. I mean, you compliment me on my smile. I need to compliment you on your passion because that was amazing. And I think you brought us so many points that we need to discuss here. Uh, I think it's essential that we tackle a little bit of the digital divide. There are a lot of people uh, already on the Q&A chat asking about rural areas. How can we bring access to information there? So we definitely need to, to talk that. Uh, I'm going to invite everyone else who hasn't commented yet, either on the participants on the Zoom or on our live stream. Uh, you're more than welcome to send the, the panelists uh, questions and we'll try to tackle them during the end of the webinar. Uh, but yes, I, I mean, we need to think of all these people that are left out of the, the, the big short conversations. So uh, next person we're talking to is Susan Reichley. I, I hope uh, I pronounced your last name as, as well. So Susan, uh, Lucinda just told us about all these people that it's not enough to give people access to information and just hope that they're they're going to somehow turn around from themselves we need also to think about the organization side of it and not different stakeholders so you are the president and ceo of the international youth foundation uh, what steps need to be taken by these different stakeholders to ensure uh, a critical debate that everyone can participate well, first, thank you. It is just so wonderful to join all of you today, just uh, listening to the commentary and, and your perspectives. That's why I wanted to be here today, not just to share what we've been doing at the International Youth Foundation, but frankly, to listen and to learn. Um, and uh, you all inspire me, uh, just uh, hearing your different pr perspectives from Jamaica to Botswana and around the globe. And uh, so I I also just want to applaud you, uh, applaud UNESCO for bringing us together and Alexander for you taking the mantle and, and charging us on with this plan of action, I, I think is fabulous. So, I, you know, there are three things I, I thought might be useful to, um, to share and I look forward to the discussion. I will have to drop off a little early, so, uh, but we'll catch up. But the first is, you know, what is something that we wanted to highlight that we've learned at the International Youth Foundation, which was formed 30 years ago. So uh, I've only been with the organization for three years, but there's incredible experience there. And the first is exactly what you all have demonstrated today. And I see every day is youth are catalysts. Youth need to be at the table. And, you know, we've been fortunate at, um, at IYF to form a network of more than 2,000 young social entrepreneurs um, who are really the ones that we see every single day are the catalyst for change. And we need that more than ever right now with COVID-19. I mean, information and access to information and, and, and critical information and facts is absolutely paramount. More today, I would say, 
than I can say during my lifetime. Um, this is a critical, critical issue. And what we've seen is, you know, youth led organizations who have rose to the challenge. Um, when the pandemic struck, um, and as I mentioned, our network, it's the Youth Action Network um, that expands around the globe. I'm, and many of you are either part of it or, or know of it. And there are many networks. They came to us and said, hey, you know, we're, we're already making the change in our communities. We're producing the PPE. We're pivoting our businesses to respond to the, the healthcare needs, the economic needs, which often go unnoticed, as, as well as just getting information out there. What do, should people do? And so one of the things that I wanted to share with you today is we've created a global resilience fund, um, which is really designed to get resources at the grassroots level, something many of you have talked about, right? Our role at IYF is to connect. It is basically to help connect, whether it's corporate partners or governments, and connect them to you because you are on the front lines making that change. And with the uh, Global Youth Resilience Fund, which you can see, and we might be able to put the uh, link into the, the chat there so all of you can see it and access it, we are also um, holding a virtual summit that is uh, truly youth-led. Um, it is that we had more than 800 applicants from young people around the globe within three three weeks. And what that showed to us is that young people were hungry to share what they are doing. Right, access to information is actually, and and I'll get to the access piece in a minute because I think that was critical that you all raised. But so much of it is learning from each other. The virtual summit is, is not people like me talking, it's people like you talking and sharing. We are connecting CEOs. We've been very privileged to have FedEx and, and other major companies that are participating. But if I can take a minute, Alexander, just to show a quick video to get you all energized and hopefully connected to our virtual summit. Oh, I think we're missing the sound. Okay, so it was, I know a little hard to hear that, but we will post the link um, both for the virtual summit and the resilience fund. Um, but as you can see, it really is about youth voice and again, sharing information. The second thing I just wanted to um, also share that we do at the International Youth Foundation that I, I hope can really help advance, particularly in the plan of action. Um, it is the skill building. It's exactly what many of you were talking about from your different perspectives. And, and um, I think, as you know, IYF has worked around the world in more than 100 countries. And one of the things that we've developed um, at the foundation is a life skills program called Passport to Success. And this is something that was developed about 15 years ago. It's translated into 20 languages. Uh, it is now online. We have a free access to Passport to Success Traveler, um, which is designed to reach 1 million girls, thanks to the PepsiCo Foundation. But the reason I'm sharing this is because one piece of this life skills framework that has been tested again and again, and we have survey tools, is specifically focused on the issue of digital participation. Um, there are four domains under the Passport to Success Life Skills, positive mindset, 
higher order thinking, which involves the critical skills, critical thinking skills, as we talked about, interpersonal skills. And the fourth domain is the community mindset, which really gets at the issue of inclusion, something we've been talking about here today. And, how, and one piece of uh, the fourth domain of community mindset and inclusion is responsible digital participation and the definition of the ability to use technology and media in appropriate um, response positive and empowered way to learn, create, and uh, participate in the global community. So the Passport to Success program is specifically designed to tackle some of the issues that, that you, um, you've been raising. And we also have a survey uh, instrument that we've used and also to be able to measure, right? Because it's one thing if we're all doing skill building, but we wanna know, um, is it making a difference? Um, uh, is it changing behavior? Are people truly learning uh, from that? And so there are different ways that we measure, and I won't get into the detail because I know we're short on time, uh, but did want to encourage everyone. And again, we can post this in the link because it's a free uh, tool that can be used and we've tested it in very low bandwidth parts of the world, um, the Passport to Success Traveler. The third and my last point will be, and it's something everybody has been saying, is that obviously knowledge and information is power. Um, you know, and, and for young people in particular, but I'd say everyone right now in our society needs to be able to learn to discern. This is an incredibly complicated um, time in the world. And uh, you know, what gives me hope is, again, all of you tackling these issues and um, being at the table because we are seeing shifts, I can say in my lifetime, we have never seen before in the democratization of information you know, between teachers and students, citizens and poly policymakers um, just across the globe. And so while on those days, you know, Lusanda, as you were telling your story of it being out there, and I just could feel that pain and anguish of, boy, I mean, how frustrating. This is the dynamic that has to change, that one holds the power and those who don't um, don't have access. And so my message to you is even on those most frustrating days, there is a democratization that is occurring um, because of how quickly the world is changing and not to give up. So my three recommendations for, or our three recommendations from IYF um, for the planet of action would re really be focusing how we focus on ensuring access for all. And that's where I think everybody has um, a, has a role to play um, because we recognize, I recognize that young people alone cannot do that. And so really um, this leads into the second recommendation of channeling this power into policy shifts. One of our three areas of focus at IYF is actually systems change because we can do everything we uh, possibly can to uh, work from the bottom up and connecting as I described. But ultimately, if we don't work on shifting systems and you all being at the table and having youth inclusive systems, we will fail. So that is a priority for us. And I, I hope that can make it into the recommendations. And then finally, my thir our third recommendation would be capitalizing on the network of networks. I mean, today we're all we're connected, right? This is an outstanding network. You all have networks. You know, I mentioned our Yan fellows. They, those 2000 have networks of networks that reach millions of people, right? So how do we, in the plan of action, think about the network of networks? And I'll stop and just um, thank you again for including me. I really appreciate it and love listening to all of you and look forward to being in touch. Well, thank you so much, Susan. No, I think it's, it's, uh... It's really tricky to, to make that jump, as you said. We cannot just build from the bottom up and expect that we, we make that connection with policies. We need to think that uh, integrated somehow so, so that we can actually take these claims from the bottom to, to accessibility, to inclusion, and really turn them into real life, like strategies that play out in real life. So I think it's absolutely right. Uh, a, a lot of people are engaging in the comments. I love it. Uh, we're going to tackle that quite soon, but let's talk to Bushra Abadi now. Uh, Bushra is a good friend of mine as well. She's the Youth Advisor and Executive Committee Member at the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and a Youth Ambassador for the UNESCO MIL Alliance. Now, uh, Bushra, I'm going to share a little bit of my own personal experience here to ask you a question. Uh, right before the, the, the pandemic hit, I was working as an intern in India 
uh, as a part of the NGO Digital Empowerment Foundation. So we're trying to bring access to the internet, to, to information, to rural areas of the country. And I realized that a lot of people think of media and information literacy as an extra step to literacy. But as I traveled to, to the very small villages, I learned that people who didn't even know how to read or write, they, they were accessing, accessing phones. They were using the symbols and WhatsApp and forwarding things. And that's all about learning about uh, sharing information, accessibility. So you did, you did some remarkable work now in the COVID crisis, translating information from the World Health Organization to different languages, because it's not enough to have it only on English or Spanish or Portuguese. Or we need to really tackle the people who live in small communities, indigenous languages, all that. So access is not, it's, it's, it's not enough just to give digital access. We need to create meaningful connections to these people. So how do we do that? How do we bring to the furthest person in Antarctica? Yeah, I think that's a great question, uh, Alexandre. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really um, excited to be here to share some of my experiences. And um, I think I'll, I'll maybe, um, pick up on the example that you just shared. So um, a youth ambassador, um, Beatrice Bonami and I um, founded the um, Health and Information Literacy Access Alliance in order to make credible information on COVID-19 um, accessible in different languages and formats um, to especially marginalized communities around the world. And that includes indigenous people, people in remote settings in rural communities, um, realizing that access to information is intrinsically tied to the right to know and the right to exist. Um, I think COVID-19 really like shined the light on this and the fact that when you lack access to information, it's really difficult to you know, make informed decisions to be able to access your other rights. Um, so the right to healthcare, the right to water, the right to education, like all of these things are deeply connected with um, the um, access to information um, uh, right that we uh, inherently have. And so as we were, um, I think, observing what was happening in the world, um, what I had noticed, and I think a few others as well, was that we were having this narrative about, about people not following some of the guidelines related to COVID-19. But when you looked at the languages that the information was available in, it was very limited to a, a few select languages. And even in communities that we already had seen um, COVID spread at that time, um, there wasn't much in those um, local community languages um, uh, for people to really um, be informed and then take um, informed decisions based on the, the best information that we had at the time. And of course, I think the information space is evolving. And so we need to be adaptable as we're learning more and more about COVID-19 and also the the other ways that um, it's uh, impacting people. So ju be not just in terms of healthcare, but in terms of um, economics. Um, I don't know if everyone can still. Apparently not because I can't hear you. So I'm assuming nobody else can too. Okay, okay. you're okay. Sure I can see you now. Yes, okay. go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, so despite being based in Canada, my connection is also problematic, it seems. Um, I'm sorry about that. So I think I left um, off about talking about how it wasn't just um, health related impacts that were being had, but it was across the board. So when it came to amplifying some of the existing inequalities, and I think that's exactly the case when it comes to access to information issues, it amplifies existing in inequalities. So the way in which like young people, for example, are already being criminalized or infantilized by systems is just exacerbated when they can't access information. Access to information also means access to opportunities for youth. Like that was a huge challenge even for myself as I was growing up because maybe I wasn't connected to certain networks. Um, my family's experience is one of being forcibly displaced um, as a result of conflict. And so I grew up as a first generation Afghan Canadian here in Canada. Um, and some of those existing networks really weren't um, accessible to me. And part of that was because of the information that I was lacking. And so even within my household, I didn't have access to the internet. 
um, until later on in my high school years versus like my peers at the time, like uh, by and large had access to the internet. And I think I developed a sense of resiliency because I had to find other ways to work around that. And I did have certain privileges in being able to access public libraries. And I think that's also important to consider, like how do we think about access to information beyond kind of um, even in, in terms of like the personal situation, but on a systems level, um, at an organizational level, what are the services that our um, governments and our, you know, um, communities are supporting? And I think libraries are a really important part of that. But during COVID-19, a lot of libraries weren't available to people. So like the closing down of certain institutions. And so it made it more difficult for people to access information in that sense. And so as um, like uh, founders of this um, Gila Alliance, what we really tried to do was uh, map out what the existing information systems were in different communities to understand how people were already accessing information, for example, through community radios. So um, my fellow co-founder um, and ambassador um, was working in partnership with different community radios, for example, in Brazil um, and different in, like indigenous communities and people who were already engaged with those communities in order to produce videos, um, for example, or different content to really be able to ensure that these communities were also able to access information on COVID-19. And so I think that approach can be applied to different scenarios as well. It's not just limited to COVID-19. And I think access to information is also connected to transparency and accountability. How can we hold our governments, our institutions accountable when we don't know what's happening? I think uh, many of our, um, like my fellow speakers have already alluded to this. Um, and I think it's a critical piece, but there's something that I also wanted to challenge. And it's this idea of accessibility and inclusion. I think oftentimes we use a very narrow framing of these issues. Access is not just about the availability of information. It's about like really understanding that information, having the literacy skills to be able to utilize that information. Um, it's about, you know, the infrastructure that's um, existing. So if you have, for example, poor internet connection, that makes it very difficult. If there's um, restrictions on access to information based on certain um, like censorship um, tools that are being used, um, those all impact access. And I think we need to be more intentional about that. And then when it comes to inclusion, I think young people, um, what I'm hearing from the communities that I work with, don't just want to be included. They don't just want to be added in after a process has already been developed. Um, the actions have been determined, the strategies have been determined, and it just feels as if it's a very tokenized sense of engagement and rather being meaningfully engaged. And what does that mean? Don't just include us. We need to be co-creating and co-developing these spaces, these policies, these laws, these strategies and programs together um, across generations. So I don't think that it's not ne uh, necessary to just have youth in their own space. I think it's important for us to have our spaces as well. But I think if we want to move beyond kind of the tokenized um, way of engaging with young people, it's important to really champion that intergenerational partnership and dialogue. Um, and I think uh, Daniel really like um, framed this really well early on in the conversation about the critical piece of intergenerational um, partnerships and really coming to those partnerships with um, the mindset of championing agency uh, of the individuals involved. So not really thinking, I think, in the, again, traditional mindset of empowerment, which entails somebody giving somebody else power. But I think that entire notion doesn't really understand that there are systems in place that restrict people's inherent power and agency. And so I think we need to really be intentional about that. So how are we as individuals, as organizations contributing to people's inability to access information? Are there things that we're doing in our daily lives? Um, for example, when we hosted webinars for the Heal Alliance, we were um, really trying to be mindful of like who our audience was and making sure, for instance, that we had closed captioning on some of our videos and or um, sign language available. And I think those are things that we need to, as a default, have. Like it should be the status quo across the board when we're looking at with engaging with people. It shouldn't be like the case that people have to ask or demand um, additional resources in order to be able to access um, these spaces um, and, the, and especially the spaces where the decisions are being made. Um, and so throughout, like, I think my, um, like professional and personal life, um, I've noticed that there's that narrative that even uh, that you meant mentioned Alexandre, like about, um, how people maybe lack, um, literacy skills in certain areas, um, but are still using like mobile devices. And I saw that narrative, um, especially, um, being shared or, um, uh, dominating kind of the new spaces when it came to refugees. So refugees having phones became this huge controversy where people were questioning, well, are they really like in a 
challenging or difficult position if they have access to these smartphones. But I think um, questioning the uh, like legitimacy of someone's like asylum claims or the fact that they're fleeing um, because they have a smartphone means that people don't really understand the importance of like media information literacy and access to information. That smartphone was a lifeline for a lot of people. Like in order for you to navigate like different spaces to understand what where it was safe to go to, where you could access shelter, how you could connect to other like people who had experiences of like reintegrating or resettling in certain communities around the world, you needed to have access to a device and you needed to have access to internet connection. And, you, and I think there was also that intentional nature of um, as like a persecuted individual or community of finding safe ways to do that. So people were using like encryption, for example, or like programs that had um, end to end encryption to make sure that their information was secure. And I think we need to be more mindful of that, even as we share narratives as people who are involved in like the media community about what we're talking about. So do we really understand the importance of these issues, even as people who like may be involved in journalism and who were like, you know, sharing these news stories that they are really intentional about the narrative that they're shaping um, and that that information is all also credible, rooted in facts, um, rooted in like a deep understanding of the issues um, and an intersectional understanding of the issues, right? People's different identities factor into um, how they're being like um, treated in society and also the way in which they want to be engaged. And so um, for my own like self, like I um, sit at the intersection of different identities. And so I experience marginalization as a result of that. So even as being a Muslim woman, woman for example, I've noticed that there are certain restrictions in the way or um, the way in which people engage with me can be problematic based on racism, for example. And so part of media information literacy and access to information is also about tackling issues of racism and discrimination um, in an online setting. We saw a lot of misinformation, for example, being spread about who is responsible for COVID-19. And we saw an uptick of um, racism um, that was being faced by um, people of Asian descent around the world. So I think we have to be mindful of those issues as well um, as we go forward um and really center again agency and empathy right like we have to understand where people are are coming from their uh local circumstances their lived realities otherwise the policies and laws that we develop will not actually like impact them in the ways that we hope um and that really again requires us to work across generations across sectors um take that global approach but also a local approach um championing intergenerational dialogue partnerships um, and even some of the work that I've been doing, um, I founded this um, initiative called Engender Media in order to um, share um, the work that organizations and individuals are doing to disrupt the global social status quo through a gender lens. And so people who are really working to mainstream gender challenge um, traditional con like understandings of what gender is like. Um, and that is, I think, really important as we see increased, increased violence um, online um, towards like people who are gender and sexually diverse persons, for example, um, women experiencing a lot of violence online. So again, access is not just the availability of information, but it's the entire ecosystem that you're involved in. If you don't feel safe engaging online, um, then that's already hindering your ability to um, really manifest a, like a informed and engaged citizenship um, that we're really trying to promote here. Um, yeah, so I think that's really like where I'm coming from with this. And I think there's some processes that people can be involved in. For example, UNESCO's leading processes on AI ethics, um, developing recommendations on this. I think people can um, be involved in that because that also relates to access to information. As we become increasingly dig digitized, what does that mean for different communities? Are the ethics that we're using um, or like framing these issues in the ethics of a certain group of people. How are we decolonizing those spaces? Because there are certain power dynamics in play that we do need to challenge moving forward. Um, even ideas of open science. So um, within open science, open access is a subcategory of that, but open science is a more like holistic um, idea, um, includes these issues of like, you know, open knowledge communities and really looking at um, how like, like open data is made available. But beyond that looking at how do we decolonize knowledge systems and when i talk about decolonizing knowledge systems it's also who we consider to be experts who do we consider um, to have expertise in the space and oftentimes it's limited to a certain group of people who have traditionally had power and authority um, or been able to exercise their power and so we need to really critically think about like how we're 
moving away from that and moving beyond, I think, narrow understandings of inclusion to think about agency, to think about meaningful engagement, um, and think about how we're governing our, our systems. And in a system that's rooted in consent as well. So not just extracting people's information because I'm seeing that as being a really big problem at, um, right now is that a lot of young people's information is actually um, being collected without their um, consent or knowledge because they're engaging in increased online education. What does that mean for a young person once that information is then exploited? Once that information, for example, because of the lack of like security um, is shared with certain um, groups or agencies. Again, when young people are already criminalized, what does that mean when people now have this treasure trove of information on them um, and how it impacts their lives in the long term? Because it's not just like something that's temporarily available. When something's online, it seems like it's permanently out there and it's very difficult to like retract. So like, how are we setting up systems and in, in enabling young people to really um, have ownership and be able to engage in these systems uh, in a consensual way and also lead, um, co-lead, co-create, co-collaborate. Um, so I just had a few recommendations that I would make. Um, uh, I think the, the main one for me is raising awareness of how young people and marginalized individuals and communities are already contributing um, or have contributed to the development of access to information and media information laws and policies. I think there's kind of this idea that we're, we need to be added into the conversation because we're like not in that space already but the but the truth is that young people are already contributing many people are writing like laws because they're involved in those spaces i think using a, a narrow understanding of young people is also problematic we need to really celebrate acknowledge what like young people are doing in this space um, as well as people from different identities and backgrounds because once we understand um you know, expertise and um, people's leadership and value um, beyond kind of the traditional way that we've understood it um, in the past. It, I think it does a lot to really make sure that access to information is meaningful for people um, and that it connects them back to their right to know and their right to exist because entire like segments of our communities or populations, um, their entire livelihoods, their, their life essentially is endangered by the lack of access to information. Um, and then the second um, piece of that connecting to the first is understanding again, the ways that information is already being accessed. So not just coming in to like tell communities how you should be doing things without understanding like what the dynamics are, without understanding what the resources are, without understanding existing like governance um, practices and standards, um, and then investing in infrastructure. So we can say all of these things and create really great like laws and policies, but if people don't have the basic infrastructure, um, and beyond basic inf infrastructure, we shouldn't accept that certain communities have like great um, access to the internet and like the, the most updated technologies, but for other communities, we're willing to accept like lower standards. I think when we talk about access, it needs to be universal and it needs to be uh, quality access. Um, so I'll just leave it at that because again, I know we're short on time and I've probably already gone, gone over, but thank you again for allowing me to share some of my experiences. No worries, Bush. I know that I, I, I sent you a very tough question to answer. And I think you did that brilliantly, uh, bringing up some key points, uh, especially because now the world's going to, a lot of countries now going through elections. We see all this disinformation going on and people are fighting up here, but they don't have their facts straight. They don't have even the, the basis of access to information, which is essential if we, if we want to, to hold our leaders accountable. Uh, now, I think one uh, example, one great action that has been done in the last uh, few months is Ian's. So we're going to talk now to Ian, Ian Saul, the founder of More, Vir Vir More Viral Than the Virus and a youth representative for the World Health Organization. Now, Ian, I assume that you must have had a lot on your hands when talking about access to information and COVID lately. So share with us a little bit of what you discovered, please. Thank you, Alexandra, for the wonderful introduction and fellow esteemed speakers for your value sharing. Webinars like this is so important to represent the different voices of youth. And before I begin, thank you um, to the World Health Organization for nominating me to share our work with you today. Believing that young people are the key to the pandemic, we implore young people, organizations, everyone to take action with us. WHO is committed 
to support the efforts of young people through the pandemic. And today, I hope to encourage my fellow peers and motivate relevant national authorities and international organizations in sharing today. At the beginning of the pandemic, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros made a press statement to young people, warning young people that you are not invincible to the coronavirus and highlighted that their actions has consequences, especially for the older members of their family. As a medical student myself, I wanted to help on the front lines, but I, mean, I was confronted with the unavoidable fact that I was only a medical student and faced lockdown restriction measures and had to return home following my university program. I really wanted to help out on the front lines. I can tell you that I really wanted to, but at the same time, all I could do was look at the news and be inspired by all the different doctors demonstrating their courage and call for duty for their family and for the people of their country. And I recognize the warnings from the WHO as a problem. I mean, uh, with further press pointing out that young people were significantly responsible for the rapid spread of the coronavirus, I was determined to find a solution. I mean, there has to be. As a medical student myself and, and representing all the different medical students and other students in more coronavirus, we believe that we have a social responsibility to educate our peers, young people, of the key messages of the WHO, addressing the worrying attitudes of young people and correcting any misinformation and disinformation among our different people in our different age groups. I realized that perhaps young people did not like being talked at. And also as, and also, um, next slide please. And also as um, Guy has um, succinctly introduced the um, infodemic earlier, I shared my sentiment to relevant stakeholders of how difficult it is to manage media information literacy at all levels. Wait, sorry, before I continue, the slide up, correct? No, I, I can't see the slides, Ian. Uh, uh, be sharing. I have to share. Uh, sorry, can we stop from the top, please? Yes. I just realized. More viral than virus, yes. Yeah, that's the reason I was, I was yeah, sorry, give me a moment. Uh, this is the last slide. Can we go back to the top slide, please? This is the fourth slide. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, five seconds to get it before I move on. Thank you. Okay, can we please move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Right, also as Sky has succinctly introduced the term infodemic earlier, I share my sentiments to relevant stakeholders of how difficult it is to manage media and information literacy at all levels. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there, I think we should all know this, since we're all involved in, in, in this, there were already good guidance provided by the WHO and the CDC. But my question to all of us is, why weren't young people seeming to change their worrying attitudes towards the coronavirus and truly understand the gravity of the situation? Why? But the thing is this, I realized that most of these guidances provided by the WHO and CDC were in English. And knowing that how diverse the world is, this means that there are possible language barriers and that the guidance weren't exactly representative or suitable for different local contexts. So I looked into this. And if you can look on the slide on the bottom left hand side, you can see the WHO guidance on misinformation and myths, which is widely available online. And we picked up that young people found it difficult to find information on the WHO website. I mean, as a medical student myself, I would go to the WHO website, but even I myself, I found it difficult to navigate it on the website. And, and what more, the presence of WHO was, was not as great uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And we felt that we need to do something about it. We need to raise awareness for WHO. So we saw this as an opportunity to bridge the gap between WHO and young people finding creative alternatives to speak to our peers and coming up with initiatives made by young people, from young people to young people among our different age groups. And now a quick example of how we did it in Mexico, having 4,600 reshares and reaching 450,000 organically without boosting any posts or whatsoever. 
we saw how important it is recognizing the problems at our local context in Mexico. Our Mexico lead, Michelle Navarro, basically, you know, identified the myths or the existing problems within the community. She, together, we recognized that WHO has really good guidance on their website. We translated all these and all these information so that people among our different age groups can be receptive to all this information. This is really understanding how do we bring access to information to young people. We need to know what young people are lacking and what young people can understand and where are young people looking at information? Do they go to WHO website or do they look at it through social media? We need to know and we need to reinvent the way how we engage with young people. And there are so many creative ways. And just like recently, the BBC have featured our, uh, our filters that we created. Just simple, simple messages and all these have different languages and we have been doing translations since the very beginning of the pandemic. And, um, and, um, and I hope to share with you much more about work as I continue this. And in just 10 days since we started this, young people from over 100 different countries have joined us and our initiatives have reached more than 1, 1 million, 1.5 million people and counting. We are truly blessed and we thank all supporters for their time and belief in our efforts. And now on to the next slide, please. Regarding the COVID youth survey, in order to meaningfully engage young people in media information literacy and enhance access to information, we need to know which media channels do youth rely on for guidance pertaining to COVID-19? Do youth know how to critically access the trustworthiness of information that, that they receive pertaining to COVID-19? We can find out more about this, but the only way to do this at that point of the pandemic, we, we decided to design a short and anonymous survey that is youth targeted and we developed it via Google Forms so for easy, easy dissemination. And we translated this from English to seven other UN languages as a study of youth and information networks, as well as youth attitudes towards COVID-19. And we did this with Saad from IFMSA, Lahiru from Global Shapers and Beatrice from UNESCO Gatmeal. We recognize that going forward, we need to stand together in solidarity and collaboration, which is, the, if, which is effectively what Dr. Tedros have been re-emphasizing again and again. And now, and with the survey conducted in late July, of two weeks, we received 2,666 respondents of youth aged 30 and below from 130 countries across six WHO regions. And now I'm gonna share, and now I'm gonna share with you three, uh, three, results that we have from our survey. I purposely did not put this, these numbers on the slide so that you guys will listen to me. <laughs> but yeah, so essentially, now, some, so essentially, um, with 79% of youth globally feeling pre better, pre feeling better prepared now in terms of knowing where to assess trusted guidance on COVID-19 compared to the start of the pandemic. And with majority of youth, which translates to 85% of our youth respondents who stated that they know how to critically assess the trustworthiness of COVID-19 related information. And that we also found out that 82% of them confirmed that they also checked if the information that they received were verified to a satisfactory before, level before sharing it online. Now this, this, this makes it even more interesting. So we are saying that use, um, with our survey, we recognize that actually young people know media information literacy. But then we, now I'm questioning myself. At the beginning of the pandemic, I said that they, we do, they, young people do not have access to information. And now misinformation exists because young people know uh, what media information literacy is. This is confusing, but at least from our, from our survey results, we recognize that more than ever, young people need to work with stakeholders to help advocate for media information literacy since they are aware of these few points that we picked up from the survey. And young people need to help to promote more research before sharing. We need, from our survey, we also learned that young people need to help ensure that before they share, they need to ensure that the information that they share is verified and, and backing up whatever they share with data and references. However, I have a 
great warning for everyone here. Bearing in mind that our survey also recorded tiredness and anxiety among young people towards COVID-19 related information and news. These results can be explained by the presence of an excessive and constant amount of information on the pandemic. So there's a clear call to action from youth to relevant national authorities and international organizations. So here is the clear call of action to them. We need to increase local tailored actions and approaches based on specific country and cultural religious and social contexts. We need to increase local languages in our communication to, local, to, to different communities. And we also need to enhance engagement of local and national authorities, decision makers, especially in low and middle income countries and those in low resource settings. Now on to my next slide, please. Thank you. Highlighting once again, WHO, UNESCO and young people have a lot of room to collaborate, not only to shape and improve media information literacy and access to information policies together, but in order for young people to effectively take action, they must be meaningfully engaged. No doubt, WHO was overall the top media channels young people rely on for information about COVID-19 as a trusted source for, for guidance. However, interestingly, at a regional level, this was not true. WHO was not the immediate media channel that young people in all regions relied upon for information pertaining to, co to COVID-19 guidance. And I have facts to back this up. From our survey, 32% of youths from North America, 41% of youths from Africa, 49% of youths in Europe did not rely on, you, on WHO as their, as, as their media channel for COVID-19 information. Only a significant higher proportion of 68% of youths in Latin America indicated that WHO was the media channel they rely on. So reiterating my point again, we as young people and, and WHO and UNESCO and other relevant UN agencies, there's a lot of room for us to collaborate. There's a lot of room for us young people to reflect reflect issues at our local levels to global levels so that you know together we can do something about it. And one of and before I conclude my sharing today, I know I, I know I've been talking quite a bit. Uh, I would like to end off with a short note to my peers. One of the reasons why we designed the COVID Youth Survey is to empower young individuals with a voice to share with us their opinions and perspective of how COVID-19 has been affecting them. On behalf, with the survey made by young people for other young people, yet again, we have proven that young people can help to bridge the gap between young people and relevant stakeholders, helping to spot the problems at our local and global levels. Going forward, I hope that with young people being a catalyst to initiate conversations, inspire creative solutions, and build supportive networks for global media information literacy action, I call upon other young people to join us in taking the lead against COVID-19 by being advocates for their health and engaging others with media and information literacy. Thank you so much, Ian. I think that was a brilliant presentation, a brilliant call to action. And congratulations on your work. I assume that you must have had a lot of work to put all of that together, but I think the results are quite impressive and. Uh, I think I speak for everybody on that. So, so guys, we have just a few minutes left on our webinar here, but I really want to tackle the Q&A, otherwise the audience is just gonna kill me. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm reading all the questions here and I put together two main sets of questions that people uh, want to know. The first, so I'm gonna address all the panelists. The first one is regarding the digital gap. People are saying the digital gap is real and they want to know especially how they, how they can engage young people in local communities uh, when regarding to people who don't have internet uh, access, people who rely on their mobile phones and, and really are, come from low income uh, families. So how can we try to tackle as young people and work with stakeholders uh, to address the digital gap? Second set of questions are people who want to, to explore more the intergenerational role. So what is the role of parents in advocating for media information literacy at home, and how can they, they ensure that the children 
uh, they, they have access to, to these discussions. So those are the two questions. I'll leave it up for the panelists. Uh, whoever wants to answer, please, you have, uh, let's say, five minutes stops and then we'll wrap up. Um, mine is short, Alexandre. Um, I wanted just to give a practical one to say, you know, I really appreciate funds that make it super easy for young people on the grassroots level to be able to, like Suzanne was saying, that we're already doing the work. Um, just give us the means by which we can do it because we're reaching the communities. But then I think I want to challenge Suzanne because I went on a quick search of the fund and then I realized, for example, to access the fund, you have to have been sponsored by Ford Foundation, you know, those big guys. Now that again is like, oh, like Ford, those are really, you have to be then ex like really distinguished to be able to access, to have been um, funded by then. So again, another barrier. So for me, I think it's about really easing the process by giving the change agents an easier way to be able to access the means, the resources of the work that they're already doing. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, no, maybe I'll go. Okay, no, go, you go, Susan. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and unfortunately, I am going to have to jump off. And um, and Lusanda, thank you for that, because I think it, that's exactly right. One one piece of the fund, I, so I, I don't think it should be that you had to have been sponsored by the Ford Foundation, but the, that there is a vetting process. You're absolutely right, Lusanda, that there's a vetting process um, that I know can create barriers. And so that's one of the challenges, um, to be frank, that we face. Um, and just as my background, I was, you know, for 25 years at USAID and in the Foreign Service. And the regulations that are put on these organizations, whether it's USAID or IYF, particularly on the financial management stuff side, create barriers. And absolutely, that is one of the things we are trying to tackle of how do we create vetting systems that are lighter um, and allow uh, more grassroots organizations to access resources, but also how do we help organizations, whether it's IYF or USAID, who are held accountable for having these systems in place. And, and I think this is a great space for, um, um, for dialogue of, you know, how do we, how do we actually do that, right? That, because that's ultimately that creates the systems change that we're all seeking, right? Um, and, you know, we, we have found some tools where we're able to do that, but I think we need many, many more, Lusanda, and um, and all of you. And apologies, I I have to leave. I do hope you'll all join us at the virtual summit because that's a place where we hope there are going to be not only many tools that are shared, but resources and ideas and coming out of that. Just as the plan of action coming out of this, that this is what leads to change is all of us coming together. So thank you again for for letting me join today, and I look forward to um, being part of your network. Bye-bye. Thank you, Susan. Daniel, you were about to say something? So yes, I'm, I'm going to build on what um, Lysander said and then the answers that um, Susan provided to Lysander. So basically for us, um, for me, I believe that we have to um, develop our local content. We have to understand what are the regional dynamics and how can we um, bring up solutions in these regions? Because like um, Bushra mentioned, um, you have to factor in the technologies that are available and avoid this whole um, um, sense of tokenism. So, for example, um, look at the financial revolution um, in, in Africa and Nigeria. A lot of people are building apps and uh, financial apps and things like that, but a lot of people are not connected, like you mentioned. And then we saw how USSD revolutionized the banking and the financial sector. And then people that, don't even, people that use basic um, feature funds can be able to make transfers to the accounts, receive money, pay for some things. And we saw how um, um, how it was revolutionary in Nigeria and also, um, and also in Kenya. So that is an idea of understanding um, the local or the regional dynamics and then building solutions that fit into that. And also to understand that um, whatever you're building, it has to also, um, the, the financial aspect has to come into play because uh, what is the cost of internet in the UK, uh, in, in Canada, and compare that to the cost of internet or the facilities that are, that are here in, um, in Nigeria. So when, when, when bringing up the solutions or bringing up these ideas, we have to ensure that it has to be meant for the majority of the population. It has to be affordable. It has to be accessible. And then it has to be something that they can easily connect to, so they, can, um, they can easily understand. Um, Lysander mentioned that, 
there is not just that you have to also support young people with money because young people are in all of these grassroots. Um, during the COVID-19, um, the likes of Beatrice were able to connect people as far back as Amazon. Here in, um, here in Nigeria with some other young people that I work with on the continent, we went to very, very remote areas that you'd normally not imagine people work with. And then you see life first and they're not concerned about the latest apps in town. They're not concerned about the latest, um, the latest computers, the latest phones. They're concerned about being able to survive or getting the basic information or just have a phone to be able to call um, the country. And that's where we see um, people um, on platforms like community radios, speaking to them in the language that you understand, speaking to them in the language. Um, one of my famous quotes from Mandela says, if you speak to someone um, in the language that you understand, he gets to his head. But if you speak to a, a, someone in his own language, he gets Yes, his heart because it sticks. Um, it sticks to the person. So you see, community radios coming up with innovations. You know, programs in the local languages using pictures and images and sim symbols that that the locals um, identify. Because um, a symbol in um, in Europe or in North America may, may mean something totally different um, here in in Nigeria or any other country in Africa. And then you assuming that this is what is going to fit, um, doesn't work. And once again, um, like I mentioned, I, I want to commend a lot of work that UNESCO is doing to support, um, we as young people to develop the solutions and then putting their money where their mouth is. But I, I think that we need to call for more involvement and more engagement and, um, you know, making sure that we have, um, we, we're giving more resources to be able to do as many things that, um, that we want to do to ensure that, um, we open up access to information that to ensure that we put push for media information literacy and be able to even get deep down, um, you know, dirty in our hands and getting into those very remote areas and meeting those young people that literally would not have um, would not have access to it. So I hope I'm, I'm, I'm able to answer the question. And then the one or the issue on the intergenerational dialogue, I think we begin, to, we, not, we should begin to understand a lot of us here, we are, we are, I'd say that we are in a privileged generation because um, the older generation, we are, we are, they, were, they were born before technology came in, um, into place, we were born with technology, and then the next generation would not understand the experiences of the older generation, and we understand the experience of the older generation, and luckily we we'll understand the experience of the generation after us. So, when a very, very key and critical generation, whereby we have to be like a balancing effect, we have to play that balancing role to ensure that there's this seamless connection between um, the older generation and our generation, and the one, um, and, and the one after us, and then. Uh, I don't like to see comp competition. I like to see collaboration because the more we collaborate, the more um, we get to achieve more together. Um, thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, I think you, you brought up some, some key points and a lot of thought uh, for people to, 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 to keep on on their, on their usual lives. And fourthly, we do need uh, to wrap up this webinar. Uh, I'll just give 30 seconds for, for Bushra or Chris or Ian, if you want to speak any last words, and then uh, we, we finish it. Um, I guess something to quickly say, I definitely agree with Daniel and Lusanda, and I think um, an important um, thing to keep in mind is sometimes we think that the most privileged individuals are the ones with all the solutions, but we're actually seeing that there's a lot of innovative solutions, a lot of meaningful solutions being built by different communities or developed by different communities. And um, they are often the ones who are lacking um, the resources, like the funding isn't going to them. They're not being you know, celebrated for the work that they're doing, acknowledged for the work. So I think that's a point of like, um, where we can actually make some change happen is by transforming um, even our mentality about like who is a leader in this in this space and who is um, you know um, leading initiatives in media information literacy and um, access to information. Yeah, and just to quickly follow up on all of that because I definitely agree with pretty much everything that was just said. But just to say that if you are a youth leader in this space, if you're a young person trying to make change you need to remember that the systems that you're coming up against are ingrained. They're massive. It's not, I feel like sometimes we can feel like we're failing, like we're not doing enough, but it's not just on you. You know, how are you going to personally solve some of these big things? So when you buck up on these, these systems and you're, you're networking and trying to create the change that you want to see, always remember that, you know, as long as you are radical in your thinking, if you're thinking about the le the most vulnerable people, if you're thinking about the people who need the intervention the most and targeting them first, 
change will always go back up the line. The problem is we keep starting at the top and expecting that, you know, it will trickle down eventually. It doesn't work that way, you know? So even in, as everybody's been saying community radio, that's one of the things that we try to do at Talk Up Radio, to tap the grassroots first, to tap the young people in rural Jamaica who have never even heard about a lot of the things that we're talking about. They come first. And then you bring it up the other way. Like, so, so don't get disheartened by the fact that you're coming up against barriers. You just need to keep fighting. And remember that people around you are supporting you and also engage in this fight. So any connections on that front and support afterwards is very important. You are a leader. You are an expert of your own experience. Remember that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for everybody that tuned in. And especially for the incredible speakers who I had the privilege of sharing this panel. I, I believe that I think about coming out of this. I'm sure that the audience as well. Just remembering everybody that we're going to keep this conversation going on the draft plan of action. So we sent the link on the chat for the participants here on the Zoom. Uh, we want to engage youth into policies and strategies related to access to information, related to mid-information literacy. I think regarding to the question of, of the person asked, uh, how soon should we include media and information literacy skills with the parents and the kids and so on? I would say as soon as possible, because it's essential that we have people growing up thinking critically about how to engage with uh, everybody. So thank you everyone uh, who joined on behalf of UNESCO and on behalf of everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. See you later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Alex, Alexandre, and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. It was great. It was oh, great, everybody. Yes, we'll, we'll continue the conversation on the documents, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> super, yeah, super moderate to Alexandra. Well done. Good yes. job.